We got things. That looks official. Look at that big thing. Look at that. Ooh. <laughs> It's actually not heavy, it's not hard to see. He actually loves this, because it looks like he works really hard. <laughs> I'm done. I did this, all the parts that was most visible. But now that we're inside where no one can see us, <laughs> you do it. That looks fancy. So these are all our uh, small batch and pilot stills. The stuff we're using to do first runs of everything before we scale up. I think it's about time yeah. that we officially introduce Deb. Oh yeah. Because she's been wandering around for a while. Just wandering around yeah, in the background. This, to Deb. this is Deb Niemeyer. She is the head distiller. And by that I mean that sometimes I'd like to distill something, but I'm gonna have to ask Deb for permission. <laughs> so Deb is basically helping us execute all the stuff that you all the decision points being chosen in the whiskey quests. She makes sure that those are done well. You know what this is for? Ooh. I won't tell you. That's salty. I'll show you later. Looks like I'm gonna set this on anything. It's like baby's first kill. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna use it with our easy bake oven that's in the front. <laughs> which the light bulb cookies. Ooh, the column. It's very, very heavy. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Hey, more things. That's the gin basket. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. Look at all those little windows. Yeah, that's what a column still looks like. And this is sort of a hybrid, actually. So if you open up all of these instead of using the plates, uh -huh. you can run it like a pot still. Oh. But the shape of the still changes everything. Okay. Shape, size of the still, size of line arm, how long it's in contact with copper, all those things change everything. Oh, what if we threw pennies in there? Yeah, we'll just fill it with pennies. Yeah. yeah. Deb doesn't We're agree. So now you're starting to understand why we put Deb in charge. <laughs> <laughs> So Deb is basically just going to be working here for the next 72 hours straight. <laughs> Did you bring a sleeping bag? Deb, you're making me look bad. I feel like we talked about this. Now what's a parrot, Rex? A proofing parrot. Yes. Yes. That you use to uh, proof. It's, it's a way that you can test ongoing proof of, yes. of spirit as it's moving it over. Through. Yes. Super accurate. There she is, there's the pilot still. Fancy. All right, so I'm gonna go to lunch. You're gonna have some stuff for us to sample when we get back. <laughs> All right, good morning. We are getting the distillery cleaned up and tightened up for the launch party on the 25th. So I have absolutely no idea what this episode is gonna be about. Didn't have a lot of time to plan anything, so we'll just see what happens. Joe's gonna give us our episode. Joe, what do you wanna know about whiskey? What do I wanna know about whiskey? Yeah. I wanna know how it's made. Here's a whole room. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you want to know how it's made? Yeah. I mean, Let's show Joe how whiskey is made. All right, all right this yeah. is the episode. So how is whiskey made, Daniel? All right, so let me turn the lights on here for you. It starts here, goes there, 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 then there, then there, <laughs> then there. <laughs> the worst episode ever. <laughs> <laughs> so you start with grain. When you're going to make dominantly corn, you're making bourbon. If you're making dominantly rye grain, you're making a rye. If you're making dominantly malt in America, that's considered a malt whiskey. If it's scotch, it can only be made in Scotland, but still it's barley. Right. You take your grain, you make a porridge, essentially. You take one of these cookers, anywhere from three to one to four to one to two to one grain water. Heat it up, and you essentially boil it for a couple of hours. Um, that's called the mash. And now you want to add yeast to create alcohol. First thing is you're gonna need to cool it down before you add yeast. When you cool down, like put it in the freezer, cool down? No, actually, if you're doing it redneck style, 
you can use something like this. I like how we have the redneck tool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you don't want to do that in here, you want to do that in your fermenter. So you want to transfer it first. These are fermenters. These are baby fermenters. They're about 10, 15 gallons each. You, if you go into a giant distillery, you'll see those huge vat with right. the flat tops or the slightly curved tops with a window on the side. Mm -hmm. Those are also fermenters. So you get it into there, you get it to the right temperature, and then you add your yeast of your preference. Then you're gonna let it ferment. Now there's different opinions about how you let it ferment. Either you lower the temperature and let that process last as long as possible, because as soon as the yeast runs out of food, it dies. Mm -hmm. And then it's done, creating all the alcohol it's gonna create. If it eats hot and fast, it creates different compounds than if it's a low, slow process. And then, now it's fermented, now you essentially have beer or wort. Beer sounds much better. Yeah. Now it's not <laughs> really beer wort, <laughs> because, well it's not really beer because real beer that you would drink out of a bottle goes through a second process where it gets pasteurized. But this is effectively the first piece of a beer. But that's all we need because we just need alcohol that we can then suck out of the mix. So then we transfer it to a still and now we're going to actually distill it. And that's the difference between a brewery and a distillery. So you take the beer, take the alcohol out of the beer. Yeah. And that's how, okay. And you leave All right, the That wash. was the, the missing piece yes. right there. Deb has a couple of versions over there. One with a column and one with a pot still. Oh, yeah. We also have a, a hybrid still here, which means that it can be a column or it can be just a pot still. If you want to use it as just pot, you just uh, shift all the plates out and use it as a giant top. Or if you want to do it as a column still, you use all the plates in. But either way, you fill this and then you heat it up. And you're, the idea, mm -hmm. if you've ever steamed broccoli, you distilled water. Because okay. what's on the lid, yeah. that's distilled right. water. The idea is that alcohol evaporates before water. It has a lower boiling point than water does. Right. You heat it to the point where the alcohol vapors start evaporating, but the water has, is not. And so those vapors come up, and imagine this is one piece or like this. Those vapors come up here, and they start collecting and building up and building up. And then you run cold water. This is a jacket. Mm -hmm. So this actually is running inside of this larger tube. Okay. And it's chilling this piece. So as those hot vapors come over, they chill, they recondense, and it comes out in liquid form. And now you have alcohol. So it'll sputter up at first and low, but then it'll jump straight to really high alcohol content. And then over time, as you keep distilling, the alcohol percentage drops until you get all the way down in the 20s and 10s. And then when you stop, right? Now that's usually called a stripping run, which means we're just trying to strip as much alcohol as we can. We're not worried about what it tastes like. We just want to strip all the alcohol we can out of this. And this is on the pot still run. Now you've got the, what's left over floating in the bottom and it's just remains of watery, not that alcoholic beer anymore. And you just dump it. Oh, okay. Now the leftover grains from the transfer from here to here, that's actually some of the highest quality animal feed in the world. Oh, and really? so it's prized by, farm, by ranchers and farmers. So you all are gonna bag it? Yeah, no, sell it. it takes too much work. <laughs> what I'm gonna do is promise one of the farmers over here if they'll come and take it off our hands, they can have it. Anyway, so now you're stripping off alcohol and at the end you have something that's maybe an average of 60 to 50%, 40%, maybe even lower if you went really low into the cuts, right? And then you take that and you put it back into the pot still or you put it into the next pot still and you do the spirit run. Now that run, you're actually gonna watch your cuts and cuts just refers to as the alcohol percentage lowers, when do I start keeping it and when do I stop keeping it? That's called the heart cut. That's the good stuff. Everything before that, you don't wanna throw away. You'll actually divert it to a separate holding tank. Then you'll start keeping it. And then when you're stopped, you'll divert the tails to a separate holding tank. And later you can add those back into another run of the same product and just keep trying to get everything you can out of it. But you don't need to worry about flavor on those ends. Now, what you create is, com is almost entirely determined at this point by how soon you start cutting and how long it goes and how late you go, right? So a really narrow heart cut, it's gonna be lighter and prettier. A wider one gets more of the heavier flavor compounds, All right. right? And when you start early, you're gonna get different. If you start late and go late, you're gonna get different flavors. And if you go to the yeah. store, you can see what looks like just clear vodka just pouring out of a hose. That's what's coming out this end after being condensed. It's just on a larger scale. All right, so now you have vodka, essentially. Not really because it's not distilled enough, but you have a clear moonshine type spirit and it's not whiskey yet. 
because it's not been aged. You move it into a barrel. Now these are pretty standard 53 gallon barrels. They're new American oak. So if it's American spirit of any kind, well not any kind. If it's most traditional kinds of American spirits like rye, bourbon, and even their malt, it has to spend time in new oak. New. New, never been used. So a fresh barrel, and then they char the inside of it yeah. and I was like that. You about that. Like they just uh, how long, how fast the fire goes, how long it burns, how deep this char gets. Those are all things that you can choose, and they'll all affect the flavor. So this is probably between a char two and three would be my guess. Although it could be a three that's just it's older. This is a used uh, Balcona barrel. All those are like that on the inside, right? And then you put your new spirit into it. Right? I wonder why it matters if it's new oak. I mean, it does change the flavor that it's new oak because one of the things is if it's new oak, the spirit is going to draw a lot more of the wood characteristics out of the wood. If it's used, some of that's already gone. Oh, and that's why a Scotland who uses a lot of used oak can have a 10 year old whiskey that looks really light and clear. Exactly. And Americans can have a five year old whiskey that looks three times as dark because way more wood impact. Now, what percent alcohol you put it into the barrel, that matters. Over 120, roughly, this is averages. If it's over 120 proof, you're gonna start sucking out wood tannins and the dark wood notes, right? If it's under 120, it'll start pulling out more of the wood sugars. Really? So if you want it to pull out more of the sweet wood notes, you can actually lower the proof to, and if you want it to pull out higher ones, you can put it in at a higher proof. Now, lower proof, higher evaporation. So if you put it in at 115 or lower, when you're done aging, you're gonna have a lot less whiskey in there than somebody who put it in at 120. Oh, Five. really? Like how much? Like, like gallons less. Oh, really? Yeah. And again, these are a broad spectrum. A lot of things change that. Now, what happens in the wood is because of temperature expansion and pressure, mm -hmm. and because of the rate at which things evaporate, and the size of molecules of alcohol and water, heat will push all of the spirit into the wood, and then cold will constrict the wood and push the spirit back into the barrel. And so every summer and winter run, you get this sponge-like effect where it's pushed into the barrel and soaking up wood notes and then pushed out of it and then pushed back in. And that's what gives it the color contrast, this give and take with the wood. Always store them inside or do people store them outside? Well, you don't want them totally open to the elements, right? So you at least want them covered from dramatic rain and mold and shit like that. Okay. Right? But you want airflow. Now, some people say you get much darker whiskey much faster in small barrels because it's a higher wood to liquid ratio. Does that mean you can age them way faster in here and you don't have to wait so many years like you do in these big ones? Well, and the answer is yes, it gets darker faster. But it doesn't necessarily achieve all of the flavor components right. that a larger barrel gives time to create. There are certain things that show up in whiskey aging that just take time. And you just can't wait that long with a small barrel or it gets overly oaky. And in this one, if you uh, don't wait long enough, you can end up with a really young tasting spiky bourbon. And that's basically it. When we bottle it, all we're choosing at the end is what strength we bottle it at. And you water it down. Just dial that out. Yeah, you just add water. So we dump barrels into a holding tank. We add water until it's the proof we want. And there's a lot of opinions about whether you do that slow if you do it too fast, it causes problems. If you just pour a whole shit ton of water in all at once, mm. that can cause a problem. If you do a slow drip of water to allow it to achieve the proof you want over a week or two. Like a little IV. Yeah. Now it's ready, now we bottle. What we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you a barrel that for us went kind of weird and we didn't really like uh, the way it tasted at this young. And we had one barrel that just turned out magically and we're just gonna bottle that one. And so this is the same spirit going into the barrels made by the same barrel company with all the same settings and aged in the same warehouse. But still, one is not the same as the other. That's, Interesting. that's how uh, temperamental barrel aging can be. Oh, there we go. Okay, so grab that glass right over there. And remember which one this is. Okay, now, all right, there we go. Now, you remember which one was which? Yeah, I do. Okay, can you smell any difference between them? The one in the back uh -huh. is uh, a lot more potent smelling. Yeah, isn't it? It's like not as, well, I'd say smooth on my nose. Yeah, 
Uh, interesting thing is that the one in your left hand is actually a higher percent alcohol than the one in your right hand. Mm. But you wouldn't know it, would you? No. Because it didn't come across as abrasively alcohol. Now take a sip of each and see if you can tell a taste difference between the two. So Remember, it. everything about this is the same. Yeah. It's like that face is the face we all like made. It's like an aftertaste. Isn't yeah. It? I don't quite know how to describe that. It's like you taste one thing and then next it's like this. Does it color? And then you got that one, which is. It's nice. See how different that is? It's real nice. Now we put it in a bottle, and I think it may be time to unveil a little thing I wanted to show Rex as a oh. surprise for our bottle. Oh. What do you get? What do you get? What do you? Well, get? a little something something arrived today. Yeah. You ready? Oh, is that a fiddly bit? It's a fiddly bit. Sweet. Turned out nice, didn't it? Yeah. And guess what? Fits our bottle yeah. like a damn glove. Just oh, nice. perfect. Dude, that is some good fiddly. Isn't that cool? That's that's Shop. top that's top shelf fiddly right there. With the whole wrapped logo around, that's gonna be yeah. it's gonna be tasty. I think we should do something to honor that fiddly bit. That's what we're gonna do. This fiddly bit, yeah. I, can, I, I could tell the moment I've set my eyes on it. It's imbued with the powers oh, of, of what? the whiskey spirits. Oh, okay. My spirit eagle, mm -hmm. this is how he's gonna let me know. Oh, and whether he's still there, it's a clue. Whether he's still there. Is this sort of like a Ouija board? Yes. <laughs> so, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take turns spinning this like a coin. Okay. I feel like I'm blessed. And to get the longest spin? We're gonna time it. Can it be best of three? No. You gotta get one chance to practice. You get one chance to practice. Okay. All right. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> now you know we get another No, stop practicing! That was your one chance no. to practice. <laughs> totally ready. You hit the crack on the table. I did hit the crack. Oh, oh my god. god. 434. Go. Yep. Alright. Oh no! No! <laughs> Even with that? 